<laughs> okay, here we are with uh, Philippe Stroop, or should I say Dr. Philippe Stroop. You, uh, you do have a PhD after all. I don't know where you stand on that. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. You're someone who I've followed in, academically for a number of years now. You're quite a prolific researcher when it comes to the shoulder. So I wanted to get you on to have a chat generally, but actually to focus in on the scapula, the contentious scapula, uh, as I'm sure we're going to talk about. So please, if you don't, don't mind, just give us a bit of an introduction about you, your history, and actually how you've evolved over the last, say, 10 years in terms of your research. Yeah, uh, well, thanks, Jared, for, for inviting me for this, uh, this chat. Uh, in, it's, it's early in the morning here, but no problem. <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, well, we can have a chat about, about the scapula because, yeah, scapula is, is a bit my, uh, my thing. I started with my, um, doing my PhD in, uh, I think, 2003, something like that, or 2002, I started my, with my PhD until 2008. And um, well, the, the topic of, uh, of this PhD was uh, measuring, the, from a clinical perspective, measuring the, the scapula. And uh, because at that time, uh, 2003, actually the scapula was big, it was, well, it's still a big thing, but it was th that day it was really a big thing. And we were quite sure that that was the thing we needed to address. So the, the next step was to, to measure it. Um, I can uh, remember... When I when I started my PhD, I had to choose. I had the option of choosing two topics uh, of doing my PhD. I could do a study about the scapula, or I could could do a study about chronic fatigue syndrome, because my my supervisor he was uh, Joe Joe Ness. Eh? He's a, he's oh, a yeah. specialist in chronic in chronic pain, and in, in in that time he was on on, cr on chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. But he was also starting something with the, uh, the scapula, so I could choose. And at that time, 2003, I was thinking, oh, I'm not going to do anything on chronic fatigue syndrome because I imagine they will discuss their, your, your, the relevance of your topic in 10 years. And I, I, I was doubting that on, on uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And now to 2020, they're doubting the relevance of scapular dyskinesis. So it's, it's things have changed. The things have changed, exactly. <laughs> Well, anyway, I've, I don't have uh, regrets on, on choosing the topic, and, uh, and uh, but after uh, doing this, uh, uh, these things, this PhD, actually more at the end, we were doing some trials, some randomized trials, and uh, we wanted to address the problem and uh, and then measure what we what we did, and that's where we actually first uh, encountered some. Um, um, well, not so much difficulties, but but a lot of questions because we 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 focused, for instance, in an, in a randomized trial on 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 uh, the scapular, and we, we wanted to 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 do scapular stability training in, in supracromial pain patients, and then at the end they, they 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 did well, they did better than the control group, but when we started doing our, my, my measurements, which I didn't do during my PhD, we actually didn't find any difference between the different measurements. So. We were like, okay, what, 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 what did we do? Eh? And that was the first time that we actually started questioning uh, the relevance uh, ourselves. And uh, um, that was the moment after the PhD, I evolved to doing uh, a lot of other uh, shoulder related studies, uh, going more to, uh, but all related to the, um, uh, let's say the, the, the pain, pain and, and shoulder problems. So uh, mm. to front and shoulder, um, rotator cuff tendinopathy or rotator cuff related shoulder pain, um, uh, and also the chronic pain uh, story. Mm. Uh, and then actually we, we didn't focus on the scapula as itself, but we always took it's the scapula thing into the studies uh, as, mm. a, as some sort of secondary uh, parameter, uh, which we wanted to, uh, to still follow. Uh, also, when doing some studies in, in athletes and in, in uh, swimmers, we wanted to follow the, uh, the scapula and still look at that picture, but not a, as one goal on itself anymore, because mm. we know maybe, mm. maybe that's not the case anymore. So, mm. And then over the years, a lot of other colleagues uh, uh, also uh, uh, studied the scapula. And now I think we've, we've come to a point that we, we've evolved a lot and we, ha we had some more clearer uh, logic sense um, idea of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into the. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very interesting story, actually. So the, it's funny how you mentioned 2003 starting your PhD. The scapula. I mean, it probably wasn't even controversial that the scapula obviously led to pain and pathology, right? It probably was barely questioned. Um, and now here we are, 17 years later, where 
you can't have a conversation about the shoulder without actually mention, mentioning the controversial scapula. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in 2003, we had, three, we had dozens of articles showing that um, different shoulder populations had uh, also uh, some sort of scapular dyskinesia. So that was in that time, it was like, okay, that, that, that's it. There is a relationship, relationship so there must be yeah. uh, a false consequence or whatever. But it's only since then that there are some uh, longitudinal trials going on looking at uh, predictive value, etc. And then, uh, because it's, that's a type of study that's a little bit more difficult to do, uh, takes a little bit more time, uh, mm. more money. And uh, we see actually that's only uh, after 2008 that the longitudinal trials uh, started. Mm. Um, that's where, where the good thing happens, of course, the interesting things on, on predictive value, etc. So um mm. at that time yeah it was it was it was a certainty yeah yeah so we could probably do about 10 different podcasts on this topic but i think what we're going to hone in on is this what i call the measurement problem it seems to be inherent uh within within scapular assessment i think there is a fundamental flaw in how we measure visually with our eyes which is how it's done every single day in clinic all around the world. We don't have fancy 3D biomechanic imaging. We use our eyes, which are very biased, which we won't get into, but we have, we have this measurement problem. And I think if we start at the very beginning, if we're looking at, well, is the scapula a factor in contributing to pain and pathology? And do we need to normalize it to improve pain? or does it lead to injury and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have to start at the start. Can we reliably measure it? And mm. I think that's when we run into our first problem. So in order to have a conversation about this, I guess we have to define what scapular dyskinesis is. Do you have a neat definition on how, we, how you would describe a scapular dyskinesis? Yeah, it's a good, good point. Um... Well, we, we, we use observation now as the, the main uh, tool for, uh, observe, for, for looking at or diagnosing a scapular dyskinesis. It's not a, not a pathology, but l l looking at scapular dyskinesis. Uh, we had a lot of other measurement techniques in the past to, um, to, to, to uh, measure the position of the scapula, but actually these are, um, aren't used that, more, uh, that much anymore. So uh, now we, we mainly use uh, scapular um, visual observation. And we look at the moment, we look at uh, deviations that are really, really present, really obvious. So um, in, in the past, we, we also used like these subtle things. Uh, um, and then we, we, we got a colleague and I say, hey, look, look, look at the scapula. What, what do you see? And then you, you start discussing what you see or you put mm. them in another light. You, you do it mm. slow, you do it faster, mm. the movements. You put some weights mm. with it. Uh, you, you did several things. You video you made a video of it and then you made slow motion pictures of it. And then you tried to find something. And I think that's really a, a thing that we, we should get rid of. That's a, mm. a part that, that's really not interesting anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. We have no evidence at all that um, obvious scapular dyskinesis is really the predictive value. So mm -hmm. if the obvious thing is not really predictive, or if we don't know mm -hmm. whether it's predictive, then don't bother about the subtle things, I think. Yeah. So yeah. the subtle, uh, the, the, in the obvious thing, okay, we, have, we, have, we don't have evidence that it's predictive, but we have some evidence that it can play a role. Mm. But then we speak of uh, a clear uh, medial, medial border of the scapula that starts to, to internally rotate, to starts to wing a clear uh, inferior angle uh, that starts to tilt uh, um, or a, a, a rhythm that's really out of, uh, um, uh, out of its linear pattern. Um, mm. But I'm, I'm talking about a clear thing. So actually, I, I, in my courses or in classes, I, I put a patient or a, or a subject or a student in front of the, of the classroom, um, all 20 look at their uh, shoulders, and I'm standing on the, on the face side of the student. So I, I cannot see the, the, the scapula. And actually, I, I tell them, actually, I should see on you guys whether there's scapula dyskinesis or not. You should mm -hmm. really see it and all do like whoa this this is a big thing and not if this if they're quiet and they're like mm, and they start to discuss i know okay it's not it's not a big deal um mm. only when there's really really something apparent then then maybe we have we, we can start about discussing some of the relevance so don't don't bother about the subtle things for now i, I think so so a dyskinesis 
in your view, would be something that's profound and obvious and it's, it's almost hitting you in the face. You don't have to use a magnifying glass to actually see it, right? So it's something that is just doesn't look right and potentially that may be when it is relevant. But if we're having to deconstruct minutia and one degree or two degrees of movement, then it's probably entirely irrelevant. Agree? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I, I don't think we we have any evidence of what we're discussing now. It's relevance for the for the obvious things. So I'm, I'm really clear that the clinical relevance of the the subtle things, the maybe the one degree, two degree things, I think it could be a waste of time. Yeah, and yeah. we know that there are so many uh, inter individual variations anyway. There is hand dominance difference. There is a difference mm. between children and, and adults, between adults mm. and elderly. There is a difference between unilateral sports people and mm. bilaterals. And it's, there is so many usual difference that we we, we cannot uh, judge or, or do anything with with these subtle differences. I think. Yeah, no, you, you're, it's so multifactorial. And and I usually quote in my courses there are over ten factors which have been proven to lead to a scapular variability of movement from person to person. And you mentioned a few, and there's a bunch of other ones as well. So we just can't be yeah. sure what is causing it in the first place and therefore if we need to address it, because it could have been there for 20 or 30 years. You know, We don't know yeah. how causal a scapular dyskinesis actually is. Okay, so let's talk about the reliability of it. So when, when we're talking about reliability, obviously there's interest, reliability or intra-person or inter-person inter reliability. So intra meaning two clinicians, uh, the same clinician measuring it twice on two different occasions, and then inter meaning two different clinicians measuring it and seeing how, uh, how much agreement there is between the two. So do you have anything to speak to in regards to the intra and inter-person reliability? Um, well, yeah, we, we, we did some uh, reliability studies and a lot of colleagues also did some reliability studies on uh, uh, observation. Uh, I'm not discussing all the, the measurement types. There are a lot of small measurements with calipers and, 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 and inclinometers, etc. And there are sometimes they're proven some, some reliability than, than on the other hand, uh, uh, the validity is mostly the question there. Um, but on visual observation, um, there has been uh, um, some sort of... Um, uh, progress uh, towards the, um, uh, the 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 system of it's actually Philip McClure and Angela Tate that the, that yeah. published these the things on validity and uh, uh, so reliability. The scapular dyskinesis test you're referring exactly. to. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and um, they show that actually, well, if, if you if you really address the, the obvious thing and and, and not mm -hmm. so much the subtle, but also the subtle was quite okay there. But if you address the obvious scapular dyskinesis, then, then the reliability is, uh, is, is okay in terms of inter, intra reliability and also in terms of intra reliability. And they also proved some uh, validity uh, measures if, if that's possible, because that's, that's a, also a big question. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but it's, again, it's, it, it, we, we also did the same if we looked, it, it, it all depends on what you're looking at. Um, and um, we, 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 we split it out in all different factors on, on scapular dyskinesis, for instance, we did, we did the, the, the scapula is a bit higher than the other, and then you've got the internal external rotation, the tilting, the, and the, you get the upward rotation, the downward rotation, the speed, the, but whether it's going smooth or non-smooth, um, you get the lateral slide positions. There are several th things we, we studied, and we, we actually saw that a lot of them are, are not reliable. So, for instance, the, the, whether one scapula is a little bit higher or the, than the other, it's very mm. difficult. And the reliability mm. of that thing is quite bad, actually, and, mm. uh, because one, especially the inter-rate reliability. Because the, the one, one clinician comes in, he says, okay, your right scapula is, is high. And then the other comes in, he says, the left one is low. And then you've got a bad reliability, although they, you've said the same maybe. But, and then you've got the, the, the hand dominance thing. So it's, it's really not so, not, not so interesting. So that's why only the, the winging, the tilting, and maybe the, the rhythm uh, is, uh, is, is something you can test mm. or see. Um, and which has proven uh, quite good reliability. Mm. Um, but, but even even yeah. but even then, there's still only like a moderate reliability, right? So it's it, not it's it's not approaching yeah. excellence or anything like that. Well, ex exactly. It's uh, it, it, then you can discuss about how you uh, report these things in, in literature because you can talk about the classic uh, 
significance levels of your reliability and your intra-class levels or your kappa values, etc. Uh, it's okay, but then there is also from which moment you talk about clinical uh, um, uh, relevance and, and then actually we see that we, you, you need to achieve quite a high uh, level of agreement in order to make it uh, from a clinical point of view interesting and that's where we, see, we often have like 0.8 uh, reliability, 0.7, 0.8, sometimes 0.9 but mostly it's, it's around that and uh, we know that from a clinical point of value you should view you should actually get to the 0.9 or more. Um, so that's indeed a, a, a good question. Um, mm. And if you see something, and, and if I see something with a patient and the patient is, is away for a few days and he comes back, then I, you, you can often see the same thing again because your, 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 your brain is, is focused on that and you, you remember it, of course. Um, but then if you've if, if the, you got the inter-reliability and someone else uh, is there, then it's really dependent on how you... Um, introduce the problem if, if i have mm. a patient and i see something and i get a colleague i say come colleague i have something here for you look, look, look at that yeah then he, he he already knows there's something going on here i should yeah. i should see yeah. something yeah. <laughs> and it's then, then, yeah, and then, <laughs> then again it's it's really bad for the patient sometimes mm. if i get a colleague in there because mm. then he's thinking okay is there is there something at my back going wrong now there are two colleagues watching at my uh, back so there must be some problem and mm. then yeah you can you can get a cascade of, of, uh, of mm. psychological things going on which which doesn't help that's mm. true <laughs> yeah so so the intra rate of reliability may be moderate in agreement i think that's mostly what i've seen sort of about maybe up to 0 0.7, 0 0.8 um, at its best. But when I, when I had a quick little look at the literature before I came on and the inter rate of reliability can be really poor, even, even when experts, even like scapular experts who are actually doing it. And I saw a funny one by uh, Ben Kibler, who was obviously one of the scapular uh, experts. And he, he had a study in 2012 with Ellen, Ellen Becker, and the inter-rate reliability there was 0.16 to 0.26 just in a simple like two-part classification. So is there scapular dyskinesis? Yes or no? So that inter-rater inter -rater reliability was, was really poor. So that, yeah. that is influencing that's so many issues in there. Yeah, yeah, it's true, but it's it's definitely dependent on what how you classify your scapular dyskinesis. Because yeah. if I say to you, okay, let's only classify scapular dyskinesis as the presence of scapular winging, mm. that's all. For instance, mm. then the, there's a good chance that the reliability will will get a lot better. Uh, mm. But if we say, okay, it's scapular, it's winging, or the presence of some tilting, or you get a non-smooth, and that's a big problem, a non-smooth upward. Yeah, what, what's a non-smooth upward rotation? There's so much uh, skin and fat and muscles on there. So mm. what's the non-smooth uh, movement? And that's where all the discussions come in and then you've got a bad reliability. But if, but if I say it's, it's yeah. really only the winging, that's it, mm. then you, you will get good reliability. But then you're only addressing one, one thing, of course. Yeah. So when, when we're talking about, if it depends on how we measure it, so that's why the scapular dyskinesis test does quite well because it, it really just looks at profound winging. Um, so that's yeah. why those those measures tend to do quite well in terms of reliability. Yeah, um, so so if if anybody's listening and they still want to keep measuring the scapula, I think the best way to do it would be the scapular dyskinesis test in terms of visual observation. And I think you can read uh, McClure, 2009. I, I think it is, is is his paper. Anyway, so I'll link to that, and you guys can go and read about it. So so that's the reliability. We'll 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 cut it off there because again, I think we could keep talking all day. What about actual diagnostic accuracy? So does measuring a scap the scapula or assessing the scapula actually lead us into thinking, okay, that means there must be a shoulder pathology in, in that shoulder or on that side. Is, is, does assessing the scapula actually lead to an accurate diagnosis? That's the, the big question, of course. Yeah. So, um, well, the, the scapular dyskinesis on itself, for first thing, maybe it's it's not that's not a diagnosis. It's not a pathology. It's it's a it's a, some it's at at most it's a variation on on what, what's happening in the normal situation. Um, but then, of course, if the big question is if you see scapular dyskinesis and imagine you've you've done a, done a reliable assessment uh, with the scapular dyskinesis test. 
uh, then you have two options or you have a patient with shoulder pain or you have a, an, an athlete or, or whoever who doesn't have shoulder pain and then the question is okay what do we do if the, in the case the patient has shoulder pain and what do we do in case the patient doesn't have shoulder pain and if you address the one with, uh, with without shoulder pain first um, well you have um, uh, the, the only literature on that is on athletes eh? is on swimmers is on uh, handball players is on tennis players uh, rugby uh, etc um, and they're, they're actually quite a lot on that. So I think about there are about six now, six strong longitudinal uh, trials in these groups. And why do they use these groups? Of course, because that's the, the group in which you know that within a year or two years, there will be a lot of shoulder pain patients. So then you can say something for predictive, for, from predictive value. Um, so, um, and all these studies actually accept uh, one, one uh, or two maybe said, well, there is no predictive value of scapular dyskinesis towards developing shoulder pain. And then only one in handball players, but they addressed only, uh, it was a study of Ben Larson. Um, they said, okay, um, uh, in, in, in the 100% male handball players, we have some development of shoulder pain and some odds ratios that are actually showing that there is a predictive value. And uh, I remember uh, Ben saying, well, it, I, I don't feel really good as being the only one who's showing some predictive value here. Uh, let's do it again or, or add uh, some women in the group. And then um, uh, the study of Ben Clarkson was, uh, the, 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 the whole group of men was added with some uh, group of women in the handball players. And um, it's uh, the study of Anderson. Anderson, uh, that was, I think, 2018, or I'm not sure, something like that. It's actually the same population of, of uh, Ben Clarkson, but just with, uh, with all the women in it. And now, actually, the, uh, this, the um, um, predictive value was, was gone. And there was no predictive value anymore. So, okay, you could say it's due to the men or, or due to the women. Uh, but actually, they had a bigger group. There was a bit better uh, sample. Uh, they also got a better power uh, analysis afterwards. So then there was no predictive value. So actually, in, in, in a, uh, when you look at scapular dyskinesis on itself, and that's the important thing, I think, when it, on, on itself, we don't have big evidence that it will develop to, uh, to shoulder pain. Mm. But now there are more and more studies that um, use it not on a factor on itself, but as a factor combined with other factors. Uh, for instance, well, there's one we're, we're going to, to uh, publish soon, I hope, in, in, in a month or month, month or two in swimmers. And also we have one from uh, Merete Muller in, uh, in uh, I think it's also handball players. Uh, young handball players, in which they show that um, if an athlete has a, an increase in load, then they can have a higher chance of developing shoulder pain. If they have scapular dyskinesis, well, they don't have a predictive don't really have a predictive value for developing shoulder pain. But if you add those two, so going too fast in your load increments, together with the presence of scapular dyskinesis, then the odds uh, uh, rose uh, rose no. Um, uh, increased. increased a lot, yeah, yeah. Increased a, lot. Uh, a lot more uh, for developing shoulder pain. So that was actually when we started to think, okay, maybe this whole scapula, this kinesis on itself is, is, is maybe not the big issue, but in relation to other factors might start mm -hmm. to play a role. And um, then the load thing came in and the and, uh, uh, hypothesis of, of well, scapula, this kinesis being a first small predictive factor, but something like, um, uh, I don't know whether you use the, the, the saying the, the canary in the, in a mine, uh, yeah, uh, which, which drops that when there is some, uh, some gas as well. Now some say, okay, maybe this capitalist is easy, some, some sort of first sign, like watch out. Uh, it's not developing to shoulder pain unless the load is increased too much. And maybe that was a sort of sign uh, uh, for developing shoulder pain. Mm. But that's a hi hypothesis. We don't have uh, big evidence on that. Just on, on that molar study in 2017, 18, I think, they also found it was the external rotation strength that led to that as well, in addition to the increase in load. So if you had reduced external rotation strength, scapular dyskinesis, and then increased your load by, I think, more than 60%, that's when it became predictive. But just those two things in isolation had no predictive value. So that's when yeah. we start to look at the multifactorial nature of injury, right? Yeah. So maybe it's the loading which brings out all these potential uh, areas of vulnerability that we have yeah yeah exactly and that's where we uh, uh, where we start to think more and more about um, it's it's important relation being the cuff uh, um, the the rotator cuff and 
um, we we start more and more to think well maybe uh, maybe the, the the scapula is is we've been blaming the scapula for decades as being the that's the reason why we have shoulder pain but maybe actually I'm I'm really uh, starting to think now that the scapula might be the big savior in the in the problem maybe maybe yeah. it's, the, it's the scapula that's trying to fix uh, problems that are are related to the cuff and uh, the cuff is is not. Not not getting it all done. It's uh, there is a recruitment problem there. There is maybe tendinopathy. I don't know. And the scapula tries to fix the problem. Tries to uh, to make sure that the cuff is in the be best uh, length tension relationship to to develop some some control. Uh, and um, it's not the reason for the for the shoulder pain. It's rather the sort of yeah maybe a, a consequence. And uh, well, I'm I'm like in 2003, I was more like it's 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 the reason for shoulder pain. And I'm almost the other way of the sling. Thing. I, I almost think it's it's almost every time the consequence of the of the problem. Yeah. And it's trying to fix. It's trying to fix it, but it, yeah, it cannot fix it on its on its own. I, I totally agree. I, I think the scapula here is. I think it's adaptive. I think it's adapting to the organism and to the demand of the system as a whole, and it's doing its best to actually allow that human being to do the task that that person wants to do. So. I think if we think about it from a macro level, we sort of zoom out a little bit and stop being so microscopic in our analysis, a lot yeah. of these things start to become a little bit more obvious. And that's, that's something that I'm really uh, trying to sort of uh, demand of my students and, and people is that zoom out and think about what the person is actually trying to do instead of saying, well, that scapula is not moving in this textbook manner, therefore, that must be leading to pain and pathology. It's far more complicated than that. So that's so that's when we so that's looking at the predictive value. And there's another there's a study by uh, I think it's Wozinger or Wassinger, if it, I think it's a German name, um, 2015, which looked at the diagnostic accuracy of physiotherapists actually determining whether somebody had shoulder pain or not based on the the assessment of their scapula. And I think it, it came out at, at 50%, which is a coin flip, basically, saying whether that person had, had shoulder pain or not based on the assessment of their scapula. So, so how accurate are we really, or how much information does assessing the scapula actually give us in a physical examination? Does it give us anything more than just looking at range of motion or looking at strength? Is it a waste of time? What do you think? Yeah. Um, well, uh it's if, if if the patient has a has a, a for instance rotator cuff related problem, um, then um, I think it, it it's not so much a visual observation I'm thinking about now, but more about symptom modification uh, procedures. Then these these tools in in are actually um, uh, often reducing the the pain in in patients. But um, there I'm, I'm using this comparison to 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 um, get to your point. Um, if you address um, symptom modification tools like like scapula assistant tests or scapular retraction tests, etc., and you get pain reduction, uh, this was often um, explained like, okay, so so there's a scapular problem eh? um, and it's related to your pain, so we need to address the scapula. But if we look at the other point of view now, we, which we discussed earlier, like well, maybe it's more the consequence, and you look at the scapular assistant test as being an, an, a way you 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 assist the cuff, uh, you unload the cuff. And the pain has less. Uh, the patient has less pain. So actually, it's more like a like a diagnostic tool for for cuff problems, rather than a, than a scapula problem. And uh, that's where actually a, a few years ago, or not so long ago, I think yeah, 2000, also 18 or 19, there was this paper on. Uh, um, uh, I think it was Turkish, or I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, um, showing that you can use the scapular assistant as as a tool for cuff tears uh, to diagnose cuff tears. Um, and that's where it, 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 it all the, the, the ball starts rolling in in, in, in direction where, where the cuff appeared to be the, the big thing all the, all the time and, and the scapula was not so much, not so much the, really to blame and, not, and but, but you can by, by addressing it with symptom modification tests you can maybe use it as some sort of diagnostic tool for the cuff problem, not for the scapular problem. Uh, it's not a diagnostic tool. It's more like uh, raising the, the the amount of suspicion. It's it's never uh, what, what, yes or no, and and we, we we don't have any strong evidence that it's like uh, 
the new um, the new impingement test uh, using <laughs> using the scapula. So that's not the case. Um, but uh, it's ra about raising suspicion towards a calf problem. And I think if if I use these modification tests, I raise suspicion in uh, towards a calf now more than uh, um, uh, than a scapula problem. Using scapular dyskinesis test or visual observation as any diagnostic test for um, uh, rotator cuff problems, I, I don't use it as a diagnostic test actually. But it can, it, if, if uh, scapular dyskinesis is present, there the chances of positive symptom modification tests rise. Eh? So that's these things are a bit together. So if, if I see a positive scapular dyskinesis test in visual observation. I know that my scapula disc my uh, modification tests will probably be positive or the chances are higher that they will be positive so in that way they may, they might uh, focus on on a cuff uh, issue so that's maybe a yeah bit bit the way I follow in my mm. clinical reasoning to mm. uh, to go towards um, uh, the cuff uh, cuff thing yeah. I often I often compare that to uh, um, um, if you well I'm not sure whether it's it's gonna gonna uh, be, do we do we have uh, image also in the yeah, um, yeah. picture also in the, in the okay yeah. so if you if you have a cup and uh, and it's full of uh, full of coffee or or, or water and uh, I often compare the 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 scapula as being your your hand below catching catching the drops eh? and and if you start walking that's when you start moving the cuff and it's the scapula that also always tries to catch the all all, all the drops. But if you start moving fast, so if you're going to load the cuff hard, yeah, then there is a big chance that it will then it will spill, and then your scapula, your your hand will need to catch more and more of the drops, and eventually you will spill, and you get get maybe a shoulder problem. Um, and then you also have the the amount of water in it, of course. If you if you uh, are an athlete and your your cup is already full, and you're you're training at your at, at the at your risk zone, well, and then start moving fast, yeah, then you have the biggest problem uh, with your mm -hmm. scapula. Then maybe scapula mm -hmm. dyskinesis arises, your, your scapula cannot fix it. While mm -hmm. on the other hand, if you have a recreative uh, guy um, who is in his 30s, not doing any sports, uh, his cup is, is half full and he's like standing still. He's not doing, he's doing, having a desk job. And maybe this thing is really not necessary. And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter where, this, where the scapula is, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it, you will not spill. Mm. So it's maybe an, I'm not I'm sure with whether my metaphor is, is coming in, but it's something I use sometimes to explain how the how the scapula works. Now maybe uh, to mm. to to get to get the thing there, and uh, if the if the load is getting too high, or or there are other factors that that uh, uh, multi factors that are there, then the scapula will be challenged. But uh, mm. it's not the scapula that's the reason why it's spilling. Yeah, no, exactly right. So that that's that, my that, hand, that, but it's still yeah. That's a really that's a really important point. So, I, I do agree when 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 there's high load or high velocity uh, loads going through the shoulder system, for example, in professional overhead athletes, then maybe there is some predictive value in it. But I'm still not certain that you need to normalize the the mechanics of the movement. And in fact, I don't know if there's any any evidence that you can. You still go and strengthen all of the components within the scapulothoracic joint and the glenohumeral joint to, to increase the strength of the, of the whole system or the absolute ability of the system. But I still don't think you need to normalize the mechanics of it. Do you agree with that? Yeah, well, um, when I say um, if you have an athlete, uh, it, it can be a professional, but it doesn't need to be a professional, but it's an athlete who has some load increments and um, if there uh, is the presence of scapular dyskinesis, I think the, the main focus would not be, okay, oh, we should, we should check the scapular dyskinesis, we should do something about the scapular dyskinesis, because it will, otherwise they will develop shoulder pain. No, the first reaction should be, we should check the load management. Eh? Yeah. Because that's the, that's the reason why things go wrong. Eh? It's mm. the scapular is is, uh, is is something we don't have high predictive value, and it can be mm. in uh, a way to to stay pain free. Even eh? that's that's also a, a big good possibility that athletes develop scapular dyskinesis just to stay pain free during the high load increments. Mm. But it's yeah, it's it's like fixing a fixing a problem, and there is a problem is in the load management. Then so yeah. Uh, okay, I'll yeah. tell you what, Tim, Tim Gabbett will be smiling from ear to ear listening to this in regards to all this <laughs> load management talk uh, yeah. in, in the upper limb, which is unusual. So, so there you go. There is some load management uh, rationale in the upper limb as well. It's not just lower limb issues. Yeah. So I'm certain of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's, 
So that, that maybe rounds off the diagnostic accuracy. Well, I'll just finish with, with one statement, which was from a systematic review, I believe, by Wright in 2013, which suggests that scapular asymmetry or motion alterations do not provide any additional clinical examination benefit with regard to diagnosing shoulder pain or pathology. So that's, that, I think that was published in the BJSM in 2013. So quite a, quite a bold statement there saying that really visual observation of the scapula provides not much more information than a typical physical examination of the shoulder. So, so just, just quickly, I'm, just, I'm conscious of your time. I don't want to keep you for too long. Are you going to work today? What's going on over in Belgium? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's lockdown time, so uh, we're all uh, working from home now, and uh, uh, we have uh, our meetings uh, through Skype and, and all these uh, things today. Yeah, that's the Good. that's our new way of working. But I, I can yeah. imagine it's a bit the same uh, for you. Yeah, it's, it's exactly the same here. I've, I've I've taken two months off to uh, try and write it out, but we'll see we'll see how we go. Um, so let's let's finish up with with let's talk <laughs> about so. A lot of the conversation these days centers around imaging and the, the amount of or the prevalence of structural abnormalities that we find on imaging in asymptomatic people as well as symptomatic people. And the same thing probably goes with the scapula. Do we see a high proportion of people who are asymptomatic, so have no pain, have this scapular dyskinesis? And and does that have any bearing on or influence on how we approach people who do have a scapular dyskinesis? And let's just talk about non-athletic day-to-day people here. Yeah, well, um, it's true. So if we just look at, uh, if we take 100 people from, from the streets, non-athletes from the street, um, there have been some some um, uh, systematic reviews on that. I think it was from um, Burn, I think, 2016, who, who said, well, about 33% of just regular people from the street will have scapular dyskinesis. So it's one, uh, one third of, uh, um, of the, the, the people on the street, not, not athletes, will have scapular dyskinesis. And uh, if you look at athletes, it's, it's almost double. It's like 60, 60, around 60%, I can remember. Uh, of people with uh, of athletes with scapular dyskinesis, so healthy non non impaired patients, eh? uh, non impaired people. Yeah, mm. yeah, That's and I've, I've got some I've got some data here. There's one from Yule in 2009 which suggests that up to 72 percent of asymptomatic uh, asymptomatic people can have a scapular dyskinesis, and then the Plummer 2017 study found that 62 yeah. percent of people, and this is just with visual observation of a control yeah. group had a scapular dyskinesis. So here we're getting into trouble again with, well, how relevant is this finding to this person's pain right here, right now, when I could take someone off the street with no pain and they'll have the exact same finding. So yeah. herein lies the controversy or the gray area. How, how do we get around this and how does this influence us in our day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, well, it, it brings us a little bit back to the, to the our previous discussion in, in in that case that we if we look at athletes we don't have any predictive value. So uh, imagine you have people who don't challenge their shoulders uh, on a day to day basis. Well, then you, you can see scapular dyskinesis or you or you don't see it. It it actually doesn't matter a lot. So if if I have a pa and also with patients with pain, if I, if you have patients in, in clinical practice and uh, they have uh, shoulder pain and they have scapular dyskinesis, that's something I will never tell, tell, tell to the patient or rarely tell to the patient, okay, whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some winging here and this and that, uh, because we, we don't have uh, strong evidence on that. Uh, I use it in my clinical reasoning more to, uh, to go through um, towards the cuff than, uh, than focusing on, the, on scapular dyskinesis. So um, it's, it's true, you can see it a lot. It can be a normal vari variation maybe, uh, some compared with a gait, uh, you you all people walk differently, so uh, maybe it's uh, it's the same thing with uh, with the scapula. I don't know. It, it's it's well possible. Um, we don't have evidence that we need to do anything about it uh, in a, in a healthy population anyway. So whether it's there or not, maybe we shouldn't bother a lot about about that about this, the figures at all. Um, only when the patient develops pain or they uh, challenge their shoulders a lot. That's the groups that. Uh, we should maybe think about, um, but in, in, the, in the healthy group, we don't have a uh, big evidence. And the big problem here is also 
that we will not have evidence in a short time because uh, if you want to know whether the, the non-athlete population will develop shoulder pain based on their scapular dyskinesis, you would need to follow a group of non-athletes and wait until they develop shoulder pain. But that's, that's, that's not possible because then, then you will need to have thousands of people and you will need to follow them for 10 years or longer and wait uh, to see, hopefully to see something. And no, nobody's going to fund that, that type of study. So that's a big thing. Yeah, we need we some uh, billionaire tycoon to develop shoulder pain and then start funding all of these studies, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a let's get, uh, let's, get, let's get somebody under yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Well, Bill Gates is into philanthropy these days, so maybe he can have a look at uh, the scapular problem, I'm sure. I'm sure it's, it's a big many outcome. But yeah, exactly right. <laughs> With all this coronavirus, I'm sure scapular is at the top of the list, right? Perfect. Well, right. We, might, the um, <laughs> we, might, we might wrap it up there. Uh, I, think, I think we could probably do another conversation at some point over the next month or so and look at actual treatment and see what yeah see if there's any evidence behind specific training versus general training etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh yeah. thanks so much for for joining us you've uh, you've been a you've been a wealth of knowledge uh where can where can people okay. find out more about you philippe what do you what are your Sorry? social media handles where can people ah. find find you well, I'm I'm uh, I'm not on Facebook, but I'm on uh, on Instagram and uh, and Twitter. Um, that's uh, that's the, the easy things I think. So uh, um, yeah, cool. if you I'll can link, link, link it on, it's easier. Yeah, sure. And and I've the intention on putting, especially on Instagram, not so much on Twitter, but I've the intention on putting more uh, like videos or uh, um, things on that f uh, to steer rehabilitation of cuff uh, cuff issues. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's the reason I started with Instagram uh, not so long ago. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll hope, hopefully have a chat soon and we can get to the bottom of actually how we intervene and help people with a scapular dyskinesis potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Eric.